trades, hirings, summer league, and a lot more. Our guest, general manager for the Utah Jazz, Justin Zanuck, is in his busy season, kind enough to give us some moments. Justin, let's start there. Are you coming with a hard hat to work with all that you're getting done so far? It's been fun uh, with our group. (laughs) Um, This time of the year is just where it's the beginning of a new season and the opportunities that present themselves. You're never quite sure how things are going to work out um, with the future of a team and uh, having a great team around us to make good decisions for the Jazz, but also just some camaraderie around. Uh, I think we've made a lot of good decisions here and we've got a few more to make, but uh, we're having a lot of fun. But yes, to your point, this is like our regular season now. The 82 games, they get to sit around and you know root for our team and support them but i literally have very little control yeah and we get a little control back in the off season um but we're really doing that in support of our coaches and our players and and uh the organization well it's been pretty much the landmark transaction of this entire summer rudy gobert being traded take us into the process of that what led to it how quickly does something like that come about there's never um a pat path when you're talking about trades there's a hundred different conversations that you have and maybe one will happen so with a guy like rudy who is such a foundational piece of what we've been about for the last eight years um his first year was my first year so we've kind of grown up in the business together um and all the wonderful things that he's accomplished and what a great player in the league and the impact he's had on winning and community and his teammates. So, you know, it's never something that you're looking at to move on from a player like that. Um, In this situation, you know, Minnesota was in a unique time period for their team building and had a lot of needs in their minds of things that they needed to address with their team. And there's just not many players at all that uh, are like Rudy. And so you get calls from teams, you know, saying, hey, I really like lots of players on your team, especially for us. We've been a very good team for the last six years. I think the most wins in the regular season in the last six years in the NBA. So we get calls on that all the time. And most of it's just basically complimentary. Um, in Minnesota's case, it was a, it was a direct you know, driven, complete interest in Rudy, um, given what their team needs were. And we were never looking to shop him, looking to deal him at all. They just were so aggressive in their offer. Um, And they already had a really good team and about to become even better if we did this transaction. But for us, we all, once everything kind of got sorted out and, you know, these were the terms, then we made a decision from ownership, management, coaching staff that, you know, this deal was in the best interest of the Utah Jazz organization going forward. How collaborative is that process where you have you, Danny, others in that conversation deciding this is the best way to go forward? Yeah, so there's lots of conversations internally being had. Um, you know, there's a direct line of communication, you know, me and Tim Connolly, and then disseminating that to the different groups that need to know and where we want to solicit input or give an update when it comes to ownership. So all of us have kind of our different roles and then collectively, you know, we made a decision that it it was unanimous in terms of do we want to do this or not for the organization. But yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a tight group, but it's, it's a lot more than just one or two people. When do you let Rudy know because he's been such a big part of the program and he's been so instrumental in the turnaround from when he first got here and and what he's transformed himself into. Yeah. So with, with trades, um, there's a lot of times that even if you're, you know, you're in the 11th hour and you think you're going to get a deal done until it gets actually done. I've been doing this nine years now and there's, I've got multiple stories. Danny's got even more, um, of deals that you think you're going to do and then they just disappear. So um, I always, you know, we have a great relationship with Rudy and his agent. We always let him know that we value you and, and that 
obviously he's valued around the league, but until that a deal is actually agreed to, I'm letting him know after the fact and taking into account for him and his career. Mm-hmm. You know, being able to put him in a very, very competitive situation with a chance to win, which he contributed to winning here so much, uh, and we're grateful for that. And when this opportunity came up, it was a nice part of it to be able to put him in a place where he can continue to drive winning for an organization. The return is something that many people are talking about. Let's go individually with the players, starting with the most experienced player that you were able to get in the transaction, Patrick Beverly. What is he going to provide for this team? So I think it's it's Pat, and I think it's also Malik Beasley. They're both, they've both been rotational players on a playoff team. Um, they bring experience. They bring, you know, in Pat's case, grit and toughness and ability to guard multiple positions. Malik brings a high level of skill, and I do think he, he has been and, and will be in our program a good team defender. Um, you know, Walker Kessler being the, the draft pick in the center, who's got a lot of potential, so I'm excited to see how he works out. There's certainly opportunity, given our roster construction right now, for him to progress. Um, he's fine from the toe. It's just don't want to rush it with him, but he'll be fully ready to participate in training camp. He'll have a long ramp up. He'll be taking contact even in August. And, you know, his plans are to be in Salt Lake all summer and work with our coaching staff. Uh, Leandro Balmaro um, hasn't had as much of an opportunity to play. Uh, Very excited that he's playing in summer league here with us. We get a chance to see him, get to know him. Obviously, he's a big guard wing that can shoot, uh, can shoot it off the dribble, um, can make plays with it, with his ball handling. And so, how does that fit into our system? And we're really excited about Jared. His toughness, grit, um, especially at the four spot with his size, can play multiple positions, guard. Um, I've got to speak to him briefly since the trade. Uh, he'd been he came in a little bit late before reporting in a good way. No no issues there, but. I haven't had a chance to sit down with him. Coach has, and uh, you know he's the type of guy that we're looking for for our program. Who's young, who's got experience in the league, um, the offensive rebounding, the the ability to defend, and the grit. I think could be a real good fit, and I think with room to improve on the offensive end. How does the conversations beginning with these new new players start? Because they're coming into a new team, they're coming to a new coach in this league, and Will Hardy, and we'll get to that hiring in just a moment, but. What are they in onboarding to this team? Yeah, so it's a it's. Thank you for teeing that up, so I, that I can brag about, in my opinion, the best player and family services group in the entire NBA. Um, and that starts with Whitley Goderidge and Lindsey Twist, and Ashley Reinhardt and Lindsey Sorensen and Kristen Schubert. Um, they are one of the first, that's the first group that our players or new players experience with the Utah Jazz. And it's by design because everyone's blown away by that group in terms of how much they take care of our guys, their families, uh, making sure that they're all settled, whether it's housing or coming in or where to live and what schools and nannies and even like landscaping and snow blowing and um, they take care of everything um, because it is chaotic when in this business, when you sign a contract, you can you can be traded and, you know, it's part of the business. So being able to acclimate as quick as possible, um, both on, you know, obviously we, we talk a lot about the professional end on the basketball way with coach and new organization on the basketball part, but just as important as the personal side so that these guys, you know, with their close family members, however, they're family dynamic is that we're taking care of a a load off their their minds so that they can spend time integrating with their teammates getting to know the organization how we want to play um getting to know the city so by the time camp starts that it's like they've been here for three or four months and and they're all settled because i'm thinking of walker and and he initially i mean he's wearing three hats right he yeah. had a memphis hat he has yeah. a minnesota hat and now he has a jazz hat yeah, i but guess the good thing for him is he didn't even have a chance to find a place in minnesota exactly so he's probably a, you know it's a shock for him but maybe his entrance into the nba was maybe delayed a couple weeks in terms of his actual destination but uh he's getting settled now you know 
no one will all the vets won't care because he's a rookie right so he's just got to figure it out we're going to help him along the way he has to do his rookie duties yeah, he does. get everything yeah. ready for i don't think the else. veteran rookie assignees have happened yet okay we'll see we'll see who he gets it's not the only <clears throat> move that you were able to make over the first couple uh, days of free agency in this offseason. Royce O'Neal out for a future draft pick. Combine that with the draft picks that you got from the Gobert deal. What sort of flexibility do you have now with that? In Yeah, so I think some people might look at this as, well, they just got a bunch of picks, so how did we, you know, we just traded two really, really good players off the Jazz. Um, and who are their replacements be? It's like a natural thing. What the draft capital and cap flexibility allows us to do is have so many interesting conversations around the league, now and in the future. Um, our goal is to add primary players in a sustainable way and a, a group that can grow. So... While well, Royce is a very good player, and I was, again, happy to put him in a very competitive situation with Brooklyn. Um, he'll fit in great there and uh, do what he does, which is be a soldier, shoot 40% from three, defend the best perimeter player, move the ball, and be a great dude. Um, for us, it represented an opportunity of another piece of currency that we could use to try and go find primary players. Um, again, now or in the future. So uh, Danny had a quote in our last availability, and I totally agree with him. He's like, we didn't have very much fun in the draft this year because we didn't have any picks. Well, now we're sitting here with three next year. And uh, our scouting staff's excited about that, and they're going to be putting in overtime work. They work hard no matter whether we have a draft or not. But there is something different when it's tangible that you know that you're going to be selecting multiple picks. Is it fun? Those workouts fun? Having all those picks come in, the, the people, the prospects, yeah, going it's to a all lot those of, games. I mean, I might feel different than maybe Andrew Mealy or <laughs> you know, any of our other guys and 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 women in our office that are setting all of that up. Um, <laughs> it'll be a very popular destination in the draft with, with agents and players because of the amount of draft picks that we have. So we'll probably get back to some of my previous years where we would we'll probably work out close to 80 to 100 players wow. and interview them and fly them in take them to dinner and get to know them and do all the health performance stuff get them on the court but yeah it's it's a it's a i enjoy it. it's part of our job and it's it's a fun part of our job but there's a lot of stuff that goes into it it's like speed dating if you're talking a little to bit 80 people i would just say this it'd be it'd be like going on a first date after you've been stalking them for eight months Ooh. because you're going to their games in college you can't speak to them but right. you're watching them or even some guys you know two or three years are you watching high school we can there are actually some new rules in the nba where there's gonna be some more sanctioned events um where we're actually going to be able to be in person in more events than in the past um which is good um but yeah i mean we're watching fiba under 16 under 17 right. under 19 uh, we're watching any of the you know major exposure camps that we're allowed to we're watching the EYBL so guys that are going to be in the 2023 draft we already have done work extensive work on them for the last couple of years what more are you trying to accomplish in this off season with the flexibility you have the uh, contracts that you can dole out I, I think the main thing is just the overall you know, the overall goal is adding good primary players that we can grow with. So, you know, as I said before in, in the Rudy deal or even the Royce deal, like you can't really plan out how that's going to happen other than continue to have a ton of conversations with every team in the league trying to, you know, when you're a trade team, you, you need another party to agree and both sides need to be satisfied with the deal. Um, so that's a little different than just going out and signing a free agent and putting them on the roster, which we have the ability to do that too. But we need to get through all those conversations now that we have a, a very different team than we did a week ago.
Right. And we're getting through that constantly every day. How close are you communicating with Will Hardy, the head coach, the new guy in charge, as he's seeing this roster come together during his first off season as the head man in Utah? Um, I don't know, five times a day, six times a day. Um, we've developed a, you know, I knew him previously uh, for the past six years, uh, just watching him grow in the NBA. But he, you know, as, as Danny has said, and I've said in this process that um, the partnership with the head coach is crucial. Danny's done that job. He was a head coach. Uh, adding David Fisdale, uh, who's, who's been in that seat before, uh, can help Will give insight. But the biggest thing is having a partnership because we're all trying to accomplish the same thing and you know, put together a sustainable winner that has a chance to compete for titles. And not one person can do that. That we need the head coach. We need great players. We need great management. We have unbelievable ownership. Uh, we have a great fan base to support, um, we have an unbelievable community to, for these guys and all of us to be a part of. So the more that we can all be connected and kind of rowing the boat in the same direction, the better. And he's been great. Where does he start popping up on your radar? Because he said six years ago, you've known him. Mm -hmm. Where does that start? And how does he get to this point where he's interviewing for head coaching jobs and he gets his opportunity? So, and... You know, just to go back to that entire process, JP, um, you know, we had an extensive interview process. We interviewed a number of people. I think overarching, you know, a couple things that I've said to other executives in the league when they've asked, asked me about the process is the NBA is in great hands for the next 10 to 15 years with the, the quality and depth of coaches that haven't been head coaches yet. And there's some great depth of coaches that have, were – our former head coaches in the NBA too. That's what I would keep my first took takeaway that I took from this was just, wow, these, there's some really, really impressive candidates. Um, to your point about will. So when you have young coaches, part of my, one of my jobs and one of the jobs in the front office is to kind of keep an eye out just like you are scouting players, right. Or young guys in college and going through that, you're doing that with coaches, with young executives, and following Will's progress, I think where he, where he got his start in the video room uh, with the organization that he started with, with San Antonio Spurs, the people he got to work with, um, Greg Popovich, Ime Adoka, Chip England, all the other people in his 11-year run in San Antonio. And then... For him to see another team, I think, was really, really important for him. He's spoken about that by going to Boston and and having a different organization and a different set of players, a different set of you know management. And so it's not all just run one way. So I think I've done that before, too. I was in Milwaukee for a year, and then eight of the last nine I've been here in Utah. And when you see something different and experience something different, it really – burnishes your beliefs because you've mm -hmm. seen it other places and you learn other things too. It's like, Hey, I used to think I would like to do something this way, but I've seen something new and I'd like to add that to what I already believe. So having that awareness, um, I think Will would tell you is, has been instrumental in his career. And then simply for him, I, I know he can teach. I know he can motivate. I know he can connect and his substance, his character, and uh, his ability to just communicate and be a partner will allow him to figure out everything else out. Right. And how, his staff will help him with that. How, how do you ask, how do you interview for a head coach? Not everybody can just walk out, hand I'm your resume. I'm sorry I didn't call you back. You, I know, you know, I know. I wanted the job. I had to eliminate you early. It's okay. But you're really good at what you do. So I you could know, be an assistant. Assistant for? The podcast? Yeah, the podcast. <laughs> Okay. That's probably probably a good lane for you. What are questions that you're you're trying to understand? Because Danny talked about this in his introductory press conference with Will. Want to know his language? Want to know that he can? We're on the the same level when we're talking basketball. Yep. Um, what are you trying to hear from him as you're starting to suss out who who's going to be our head coach? So, it's it's pretty simple, really. Um, it's hard to make the decision. It's hard to 
have a process and come away knowing when that person hasn't ever worked, you know, in that role and in that role in this build in, in our building in Utah. But what you try to do is mo all, like I said, all these candidates were great with their basketball acumen, you know, that they can teach and all those things. I think the biggest thing that you're trying to make a projection on is their presence, their leadership, their partnership, things that they don't even know yet what they're, they, cause they don't have a, a body of work to they point haven't back. Done it. They yeah. haven't done it. Um, the self-awareness of knowing when you're in control and when you're not, um, how you deal with difficult situations, um, how, because when you walk in the building as the head coach of the Utah Jazz, you're the, you know, one of the main faces of the organization, one of the main faces of the community. Um, can you, you have a ton of people that are looking up to you, uh, when you walk into that building. So being able to lead, um, both proactively and, you know, subtly with the people that you interact with and the, and the job has become so big. There are so many more people in an NBA organization. Now you're talking about, you know, three to $5 billion valuations of companies. Um, it's a big, big job. And Will will, I, I, will is very much up to the task. He also, I think, knows that he's, he has a great amount of support from the organization to help him learn and us being able to grow with him. It's one of the things, frankly, I'm most excited about. Because that's the thing. You're buying pretty early on, on the Will Hardy experience. He's, I, lo he's I loved his quote. only 34. I loved his quote. Yeah. He's like, I'm 34 and I'm fine with it. Yeah. It's great. Which is the way it should be. You know, he, right. He's, he started at an early age. He's gotten unbelievable opportunities and experiences. He's delivered on that. And uh, he doesn't have to make any apologies for anything. Right. He was, he was the best guy for for us and by far in the interview process in my mind and i was really excited to work with him when it's quite the doctorate to get when your basketball finishing school was with greg popovich and then uh in your first year when you're outside of that organization you're going to an nba finals you know yes, so with he, Ime adoka and brad stevens yeah, he's seen it know? all he's gone to team usa yep. alongside uh pop steve kerr all the great names like the the references that he can draw from are pretty expansive and yep. pretty extensive that really help him out. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> I don't think there was a question there, but I agree. Well, he's not the only hire that you mentioned. You mentioned David Fisdale as mm -hmm. somebody who's brought into the front office. Uh, how have those early collaborations been like? What brought him here to Utah? Oh, uh, they've been great. So um, Fiz and I didn't, we have a lot of mutual friends. And obviously he's had a long coaching career um, in really good programs, has been a head coach twice, you know, coming from that Miami program. I think where, I don't want to speak for him, but he, you know, over the last couple of years, he's really thought about a front office role and more of that organizational planning rather than, than coaching. And uh, was looking for an opportunity to come in with, a, you know, a good organization and to come in and learn and I couldn't be more excited he's got so much positive energy um, he's really excited to just come in and learn the business because it is it's it'd be like me even though I've been in the league nine years now all of a sudden I want to go coach like if I wanted to be an assistant coach I'd be going down there and be like I don't know anything it's like me asking to be an assistant coach not quite not quite but yes we would I be tried yeah me and JP, you and me would be doing a heck of a lot of listening. Right. Because it's just a different rhythm. It's a different schedule. It's what you're focused on versus what you do in the front office. And so it's a little bit of the opposite. It's still basketball. It's still player relationships. But it's a whole other world. And he acknowledges that. And I'm really excited to help him grow with it. I think he's got great talent. How do you think that that going from a head coach you're in charge of so much in an organization to being a little more removed from that and and now going into a front office position where he calls it his, his front office internship yeah um I, I think you just get re-energized when you're still around a game that you love and then you know doing different things with people that you really want to do them with so 
you know, right timing in his life or what, you know, he's, he's seen enough on the coaching stuff where he can still be a great source of counsel for coaches because he's seen and done the job much like Danny. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so this is kind of a, a new chapter in his life and we're excited to start it with him. Let's wrap it up with your summer league. What are you looking for from players? Not only they got their games in, in Salt Lake, but here in Vegas, young players an opportunity to show themselves to not only your team but every team in the league as everybody's descending on this city for this showcase so i think a, f a few things um specific to our team first you know what a great opportunity to run lead a team and show off the work that that he's been doing is in jared butler's opportunity um that one's key he is he is a, a roster player for us and then Overall, conceptually, our coaches, you know, them being able to work with these players and start planting seeds of concepts that, um, one, will help the players that may not be on our roster, uh, you know, that are playing in our summer league to help them acclimate if they are in training camp or somewhere else. And with our players um, that are on our roster, you know, some of the points of emphasis um, that we're going to be pushing. And not to speak for coach, but I think you can see it in our play. Um, you need to be in great shape. You need to play hard, try to play fast and guard, you know, and a lot of this run up, uh, whether it's been individual sessions or in parts of practice, you know, the defensive end of the ball has been a huge emphasis and guys that can do that switch play together as a unit. Um, you know, it hasn't shown necessarily in the results in Utah. We had a bunch of guys that were injured or not being able to play during the Utah Jazz Summer League, but finally came together in this first game here in Vegas. And so I'm, I'm excited to see see those guys tonight and see the progression. How have you enjoyed watching Jared Butler respond from even what he said? He, he didn't enjoy his very first game of Summer League, but he still came back and, and tried to, to do more things and show his passing, his facilitating, other things that he was adding to his game beyond just uh, having a good box score. I mean, he's a good player, and he's really competitive. Mm -hmm. um, he's competitive for his team and competitive for himself. So, you know, him not being satisfied with his performance doesn't surprise me. And, you know, frankly, he's a little stubborn. And that's – I mean that in a complimentary way. Like, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to be – you know, he's got great confidence in himself, as he should be. So just that's going to happen. I mean, you're going to have bad games in the NBA, and so how you respond to that, how you adjust, um, you know, that's that was his first game playing twenty yeah. some odd minutes, you know, a week ago in what probably since preseason last year, you first know, summer or maybe you know the three or four games he played in the G League because we had all these injuries, we didn't really have a chance to have him in the G League very much. So it's probably been a good three or four months since he's played. NBA competitive level game. So your first game, you're at altitude and you get exhausted really quick. You're so excited. You know, you, you expend a bunch of energy a little earlier. And I think he's learning to kind of pace himself, but also know he's in shape and do the things that he can do and on the court that helps drive winning and, and then guard, which what? I think he's done a very good job of. And it's your first summer league game. It's a different <clears throat> game, summer league. You yeah. know, you're you're getting thrown into an environment with new teammates, new players, figuring it out, and trying to understand how am I going to do my usual pick and roll when I'm used to one player, and now I got somebody thrown in. Yeah, the only summer league team that has like a lot of continuity is Oklahoma City when they had like yep. eleven roster players. You know, everybody else is fighting the same thing. How can you be connected with a bunch of new people around you in two or three days of practice? So. That's where you see improvement and why we like to have our summer league and then the Vegas one. We get eight games. So we get a chance to have see the progression of individual pass for a little longer than other other NBA teams. Is there added pressure because there's a ring that comes at the end of it? I don't know who decided that, the ring. Would you want it? I don't know. Or is that going I don't to think Bart Taylor? Probably, I'm, I'm like a very minimalist jewelry guy, so... Okay. I got one. It's my wife. That's it. Right. Everything else, that's TBD. So, no, to answer your question, I don't think there's any more pressure. <laughs> no? No. I don't oh. Know. Just no. You want to win, though. I mean, so you want to win. Well, yeah. 
I'd be happy winning the thing without a ring or a ring. I think there's enough pressure considering you still have the middle of the off season, more yeah. things to do, yeah. an entire team to run. That's yeah. some pressure. Yeah, we'll, we'll deal with that. It's part of the job, and it's one of the reasons I love being here. It's, it's a lot of fun. General Manager of the Utah Jazz, Justin Zanuck, on Round Ball Roundup on utahjazz.com. Justin. Thanks, JP. Appreciate you.